Dobrý den, dámy a pánové. Vítejte v kempu v Centru architektury a městského plánování na oficiálně první akci nové třetí sezóny. Dnešní akce je v angličtině, tak pokud potřebujete sluchátka, tak tamhle tlumočení, abych jinak teďka s dovolením přešel do angličtiny. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here at CAMP, the Center for Architecture and Metropolitan Planning. This is officially the start of our third season and the continuation of our Urban Talks uh, lecture cycle. Uh, it's my great pleasure to have Martin from MandaWorks uh, speak here tonight. But before I give the floor to him, I'd also like to thank our wonderful partners at the Architectural Institute in Prague and ask Regina to say a few words. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stepan. Uh, welcome here, and I'm also happy to have here Martin and Katarina as well, standing there in the background. And they are our third guest in so-called Scandinavian series. And I guess we are like in the middle. We have already welcomed here Jakob Kurek from Henning Klaarsen Architects. Also Jenny Osulsen from Snehta. Today Martin Arfalk from Mandaworks from Stockholm. And we are planning more interventions, more, more events. And today we have started our new academic year also with the help of Martin and Mandaworks. So we have an intensive workshop with our students taking part uh, at our premises in Docs Plus for oh, one and a half day, let's say. And uh, all of you are welcome to have a look tomorrow how the students work under the leadership or in cooperation with uh, Katarina and Martin. So that's all for me. And uh, Martin is the uh, co-founder of Mandaworks. They are in existence for 10 years, I calculated. And uh, they are working across the scales, across the continents as well. But he will tell you more. Welcome in Prague, Martin. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here tonight. And um, this is by far the widest screen I've ever <laughs> used for a presentation. So bear in mind that sometimes a picture happens over there, over there. So I'll be walking a little bit back and forward. I hope this will be enjoyable for you. My name is Martin Arfalk. I'm the co-founder of MandaWorks. I'm 45 years old. I have two kids, one cat, two rabbits. I love ice hockey and I love my work. I have a great passion for design, planning, anything that has to do with our society that we live in. So MandaWorks isn't a typical architecture office. We're not predominantly building. We're uh, a bit more into the strategic pre-phase of projects. So we're supporting in the early phase of master planning, and then we take steps into the design process, both architecture and landscape architecture. Most of the projects here tonight that I will show you are still projects on the drawing table. And I'll try to walk you behind the scene and let you know what my thinking is about master planning, architecture, and landscape architecture. I can tell you one thing. I think it's all integrated. It's all one thing. And that is the challenge and for us the opportunity as designers when we form the future. With the logo on the two sides, you also see a few icons. These are icons of projects that we work with. One essential thing that we talk about when developing projects is what is the essence of the project? Now you can make numerous of sketches and you can have all kinds of ideas of your design, but you also need to be able to bring it down to one sketch, one short explanation as how you explain to your kid why you're not supposed to do a certain thing or why you're allowed to do that. We have to be able to explain our ideas. So the essence of this project comes down to these shapes or to these ones, or as you see on the other side. We work with simple geometric shapes, or we work with the ideas of layering the city with various concepts. We think that a symbol can be the introduction to a story that have many, many layers. We bend and we look at the world as a section or as in plan. We go from strict geometric forms to organic loose shapes. 
And to the very right is the tallest tower we've ever sketched on. It was for a big project in China. That's the place to be when you want to go big. This is us. We're 19 people from 13 different nationalities. This guy here, he's my partner. So this is me, huh? And this is my partner. A mix of people from 13 different nationalities. This is creating the international base of Mandaworks. This is how we operate. This is what formulates the thinking. This is what opened up doors to us. This is why I'm here. Because I met Katarina many years ago, and I met Cyril, who many of you also know. We met in Lund, where I used to be a teacher at the School of Architecture. They came to Stockholm, we worked together through them. I come down here, we could participate in projects. And that goes for many other countries. So we work in Holland, we work in China, we've done projects in Belgium, in Finland we work a lot, and we work in Canada, and this is amazing. The mix of languages, the mix of backgrounds, the experiences that we all sort of cook together, that's Mandaworks. This is mostly happening in Stockholm. So you have uh, one of the most beautiful uh, capitals of the world, uh, we do as well. So I had to show you this one. The picture isn't only showing uh, the beauty of Stockholm, it's also sh showing cranes everywhere. So Stockholm is one of the cities that is undergoing a lot of changes. It has been one of the most um, fastest growing cities in north of Europe in the last 10 years. So this has created a lot of uh, pos possibilities for us as planners and architects, which has been really amazing with a set goal, which is very, very high. Stockholm has developed many good um, goals for sustainability, for architecture and for planning, which we have been uh, fortunate to be part of. This is the building where we sit. This used to be an old brewery. These are our windows. The shoes are not ours, but th that's happening on the street. This is inside of Mandaworks. We have 12 meter floor height or ceiling height. And this is where we do most of the work. We also have an office in Canada, in Montreal, and we have um, a branch in China, in Guangzhou. But most of their creative work happens here. So who are we? We're optimists. We think that the world is bright. And we think that we can even make it brighter. We invest time to imagine how to make the city better. Now, meeting a client or taking part in a competition, the, one of the main reasons or main factors to why someone asks you is because they want to have a twist on the answer. They want to have the answer they can't find themselves. This is one of the trickier challenges many times because it's not that easy. Sometimes the answer is quite obvious or the answer is really difficult for, because the question is complex. This is our role, to make the question understandable, sort of clean out whatever is covering and clutching the, the question into what we imagine is the clear, clean question behind this. And then we can start to build on an answer the context is very, very important. With Mandaworks having its base in landscape architecture, I used to work and live in Holland for many years before I started Mandaworks. And I learned how they developed the culture of architecture and landscape architecture through the landscape, which was necessary. It has happened for many hundred years, or Holland would not have existed. This is two things working together. So the sensitivity, the imaginative, and the unexpected design, those together are key words for us. Who are we? Are we the ones sitting on the box or sitting on the floor? We're both. That's how we also like to operate. We never see ourselves being the person or the office having the answers in, to our client. 
we can also be the one that ask our client answers and want to understand what he says or she thinks about it. But it's many times our role to interpret this, to do something out of it. So in a positive way, the colors are shiny and um, we use the walls, the spaces. There's no boundary between inside and outside. We think in steps. So one thing we always tell our client when they ask us, why should we hire you and not this other office? We tell them, well, if you hire us, or you should hire us, because we will not give you one answer. We will not come back to you with a solution. We will come back with, to you with maybe four ideas, or six ideas. Together with you, we want to narrow it down to maybe two or eventually one that we both believe in. And I told the students here before, we do this very often, of course, also from a strategic point of view. If you can engage a person, a client, to a conversation, he or she will feel that we do it together. So strategically, I can present four options. One is one that I believe in. Second one is, it's a fairly good one. The third one is probably a very smart one, for what reason? Fourth one is, it's, it's not possible. But by telling them the story about the four, we can understand which one they like, which one maybe can be influenced by new data they have. Or we can understand in what direction we should take two of them to cook, so eventually we build it together. Another way to do this is to, to show them the extremes like the very cheap model or the very expensive model, then maybe the modest model, to understand now the client, is, is he having a lot of money? Is he willing to go that direction? Or are we talking about this kind of solution? Because with no matter what you have, money, time, space, what you get is what you have to play with. And that's also the fun fact that this, if you come into a box and there are three toys, and someone tells you to play with them, and you go, ah, oh, I want to have four toys, I don't like those toys, or I, I want to have different toys. How fun is it going to be? If that's what you get, and you think, of these three toys, I can do something really fun. I can, I can make something, then you will. That's a little bit how we need to think. So in steps, eventually the idea pops up. Because also what we believe is that we need to have the conversation back and forward. You have to put down a sketch and believe in it. I sometimes, I'm so convinced we found it. This is it, it's perfect. And I push it. I push it in the team, maybe sometimes I push it so we, everyone just feels irritated about the pushing. And then somebody starts to sketch on what we thought was it. And maybe someone else think, well, I get inspired, how about we do it this way? And all of a sudden, the sketch that we believed in starts to become alive. And eventually, from that steady point, it becomes a dynamic design. And that's when we probably will have found the idea. So sometimes, I even push more than I believe myself. Because by pushing, you can get something out of your team and your members. I think they do it to me as well. At least that's what I think when I see some sketches sometimes. We focus on space for people. Human experience, that's the center of our work. It really is for us. Because thinking from out the public space, the space between buildings, we need to. And working predominantly for municipalities, that's also our client. We strive to create places that make people feel connected, stimulated, and joyful. Now, how do you do this with a lot of people in the city when we at the same time as we're building for people, also have a lack of space. In Stockholm, probably the same here in Prague, you also have to deal with the uh, house prices. And that most people want to live in the city center. 
And the city center is not only the traditional historical city center, it's the neighborhood, the suburban area that now densify. It also has a periphery and a center. And you have a client that maybe wants to get maximum money out of the investment. And on top of that, you have social functions, such as kindergarten, school, uh, parks, etc. All of that has to go into the same box. This was an exercise we did for a competition in Stockholm um, last year. Now, the client asked us to fit so many hundred thousand square meter into a site. They told us they had studied the square meter and the division between school and the office space and housing, etc. When we put this into the site, we made skyscrapers. It was only the problem that they also wanted two parts, schools, kindergarten. A kindergarten in Stockholm today needs 30 square meter per kid. Now, imagine you want this, but you also want to make the space. A courtyard in Sweden, same as here, wants to have sunlight. We even have regulations that says how much sunlight has to go into an apartment. It's called a daylight factor. The daylight factor is calculated by the way the sunlight comes into the apartment, how long it stays, what kind of space the function of the space is, etc. So all these factors makes it difficult to both want to build a dense city, the urban living, and combine that with the qualities that we also put on top. So this was an exercise. They gave us this 100%. And what we did, putting them together, we overlapped programs. And in the end, we gave them 20%, 25% more. So what did we do? We split all the program. We took the school restaurants. There were four of them. We took the kindergarten restaurants. We took the space where the retired people meet in the evening, where the sport club meet in uh, daytime. We took all these different functions, sport fields that school uses, uh, sport field that the sport club uses, etc. We merged them and we invented the idea that we overlap and we double use, meaning that you will have a restaurant that works for school daytime in the afternoon. That's where the retired people meet. That's where the sport club will have their sessions in the evening. This cannot happen in one space, but it has to happen in various spaces in the city. You cannot think that we only make big gestures for each individual, but we need to think in smaller units to operate in a much more mix in the world, and in this case, in Tebu Centrum. Some of these sketches, if you can follow, suggests <clears throat> this overlap between different functions where you also combine the living with also working and the working then with the school facility, etc. So by thinking that we share space, we can load the city with much more. And this is tricky because the developers, they need to accept that they cannot be owners of each square meter. And this is becoming a, more of a trend, like workplaces, you know, how you can go to a cafe now and rent a place. This is becoming a stronger uh, um, theme on many developments in, in Sweden, because it's too expensive to sit on a unit that is empty two-thirds of the day. You need to load it. But in order to do this, we have to allow to share. And therefore, you can also not think in big boxes. It's actually the opposite of IKEA that we've been so good at, but to think of the smaller units. One of the streets in the proposed area. So we create spaces and we live with them. And um, this is one of the absolute most inspiring projects that I've ever worked on. It's also the project that I worked the longest on. We won a big competition five years ago on a master plan for a development of what is called the Royal Seaport in Stockholm. And the part that we worked on is this one here. 
I will not go into detail to, to talk about the project today very much. It's a very interesting project. But I will talk about a specific uh, thing that we have worked with to generate the quality of the project that I find very, very interesting. This is the plan. So it's a housing scheme. We invented an idea of an island. This is the historical coastline. And we invented the idea of a water arena, a public space where people can meet around the water. It's a mix of housing, offices. It's quite high-end living. It sits on the water. It's a beautiful view and everything. This project is run by the municipality of Stockholm. In Sweden, municipality owns all land that are, they, not all land, but they own most land. And the land they don't own is still land they detail plan. So if a developer wants to develop, it still has to go through the municipality. In this case, the city owns the land. So they need to find a plan that works for all the qualities they want to have. But they also want to have a plan that works for the developer or for the public space. So it's both economically feasible, but in the end also is working together. So what we developed for the developers and for the municipality to have as a base when talking to developers was something called a quality book. And a quality book is not so unique. It's, it's happening quite often probably here in, in Czech as well, where you describe architecture or certain quality of the public space, etc. But one thing that is quite typical for a quality book is that it's separated, separated by blocks. You talk about one block. We talk about the quality of architecture for that block. And then we have maybe a chapter about public space, etc. We twisted this and we said it's never going to be about one block. It's always going to be about the space in between the buildings. So I, I took a few print screens of, of the book to, to show you, to explain what I mean. So you saw the master plan. We then take one part out of the master plan, this case is the water arena. We take the buildings that are framing the space, and we take the space inside, and then we put ourselves there, and then we ask ourselves, what do we need to do here to best make the best space in Stockholm? What is required? Now, we can make great design, nice shapes, uh, use uh, wood and uh, concrete and uh, nice trees, etc. But if the architecture is working against this by using completely different material, maybe be very tall or n not having uh, windows towards the water, etc., it's not working. The opposite is, of course, if the architecture is doing everything, but then there's no money put into the public space, people are not coming there, why would you have your cafe fronting this water, etc.? So when setting up this quality program, we get into the space and we start defining height of buildings, shape of roof, quality of the facade, windows, balconies or not, brick, wood, kind of material, size of street, trees, design of public space, material, where to go high, low. And this is an example. We did this for every space. We never talked about a block. We talked about each individual s street or square or park or whatever it was. So in this case here, it's a, it's a square that is doing the same with the same rules and how that works together. This is all in Swedish now, but in principle, we, we dis declared then type of material, the treatment of the roof, balconies, etc., combined with the landscape. So in this case here, it was very important to support the function of the ground floor of the building. So we had a certain type of material, a certain width of the sidewalk, whereas in another street, maybe it wasn't as important. It was maybe entrances for private living, and then it was a different configuration. Because the one supports the other, or the one can break the other. Very important. So with one image, explaining this again, 
Now, this is also how we work very often with images. We worked with a type of material. We took the reference <coughs> of a city like Hamburg, where you have these brick buildings close to the water, how we wanted the expression of, of the architecture, how we did not want a lot of balconies, but we wanted this to be a public space so that you actually would have the space, feel the air. We played with the heights up and down to let the maximum sun come down to the public space. So in case here, the ones here, they went low, so they would hit this one here to become this image. Th I think this is one out of uh, four versions of this image. This is what we would consider integrated master planning. So when we talk about master planning and we show these aerial pictures or bird's eye perspectives and we count numbers and, and we draw systems and structures, we never do this without being between the buildings as a human. It's super important. It's the softness of the planning that we as a designer have to depend on. This goes beyond numbers. Sometimes you can prove things with numbers. That's excellent when that happens. But many times you have to also fight the numbers with softness because it will generate other type of qualities. So another example on this quality book is this historical coastline that we turned into a canal and into a park. Same thing here, a rule that says something about the height. In this case, we wanted a different typology. We wanted uh, the mix of row houses, smaller units, a little bit stacked, because we wanted low buildings and we wanted a lot of entrances. We had the, the, the dream of Amsterdam, like many people should come in and out of the doors. The canal becomes the public space that everyone has access to. And in the park, it's the same thing. You cross the street and you're into the park. So these buildings, they don't have any courtyards. We argued and said that the courtyard actually happens in the street. And by having this mix and also the expression of architecture, we could create this red thread through the area. With access down to the water. And again, same rules or different rules, but rules which then would talk about this contact between entrances and street, the relationship between green, and here you see it's a different expression of architecture. So let's say that we developed about, I think, 14 variations. It's, it's almost like you run dry after a while. But what you then have to do is to really believe that it will be unique. A street that is facing north, or a facade that is facing south, or a street that is wide and can have a lot of trees, or a block, with buildings that wants to have balconies towards the south, cannot have it towards the north. If you get into these details, you start to understand how the city is really an organism. We cannot plan it from above and just allow things to happen. Because when we are pointing out, curving and changing these lines and getting into it, then we're really, really into the sensitivity of the city. And then we can be as happy as uh, the young child here. So public, private spaces coexist. This is a mantra that we keep on telling and that is very, very important to us. Beautiful hands, huh? This is about 20 years ago, my hands. They would look different today. I learned from one of the first um, <coughs> colleagues I had in Holland to work a lot with pictures, sketches, and the ideas of, of using things that we see and place them into design and how we would think of them differently. Clothing and many of these things. And we took this picture for a project where we wanted to talk about how things were integrated. The landscape and the architecture to be one. And the fingers or the hands, that's the master planner that holds on these different colors of things happening in the master plan. So in the search of quality for this project that I just showed you the quality book of we had to reach to the point to get to this uh, plan how did we do this 
We did it by taking a number of steps and anchored those steps with those arguments, with those gestures into the context of the site. The first thing we did was to in identify the most vital space, which was this water arena. This was an intervention that created a meeting point that where people could meet around the water. I showed you the pictures of the historical coastline. This was something that we wanted to be, friends with the history. So even though we invented the idea of an island and we added loads of other things that would sort of take out the uh, science of history, we brought it back. Very, very important. Not only important, it also helped us a lot because by doing this, we had this reason to actually get the block here that wasn't a block anymore. It was like a triangular shape. It has caused a lot of problems. It's not the typical great block to, to draw housing in. But it creates this um, not rational structure that we also sometimes need. Like how we like historical cities and they're a little bit awkward, spaces are happening and a building is popping up and a little bit of a courtyard is happening. Ah, this is what we like. But we have to find clues on how to do this ourselves. That was the historical line, very important. Of course, you need to connect to the context, in this case, a higher green hill. And you create the sight lines, you divide space to make good blocks, living conditions. Also connect people. How do you create mobility in the area? Identify the crucial public spaces located in the best spots, getting the best attention. Here by the water arena, here by the public transport, on the water, etc. And then playing the volume, the masses, up and down to create the best sun condition or sheltered space for the area. But not only, also allowed to bring up, to create identity, variation of topologies of, of architecture, and also to be smart with how do you play with the masses. Because in the end it has to add up. But if we can locate the tall buildings in, in good positions, we're allowed to go lower in others. So this is what it uh, looked like. It almost looks uh, the same. And this is what we envision it to look like in the future. We create narratives. These are all pictures from uh, this project. Where we created the narrative of the water arena. The narrative of the street, not having trees on two sides, not about a boulevard, not about how fast can you drive on the street, but about a specific place. The historical uh, coastline became a canal, or in this version, or how you can live as a student on floating houses on the northern quay. We test options for this project. We built a model and we started then five, maybe six years ago to th test various ideas. And it grew and it grew. And at this point, there was a midterm presentation. We brought all these models to the client. We had a preferable model, but we gave them also this width of um, various ideas. Now, together with them and with our team, we started to understand which ones weren't really doing the work that we wanted to happen here. And the work went on and on, and we had one. So Manda works <coughs> work with various scales and spaces and uh, commissions. Public spaces, landscapes, large landscapes, neighborhoods. This is probably one of the most common scales that we work on. Typical uh, mid-sized Swedish city, 
that expands and how to actually deal with a sort of an urbanity on the periphery of a city with quite a massive program nowadays combine that with all the wishes of green living and uh, no cars etc a lot of those topics that we deal with in our projects and then we uh, travel to china quite often and work on the very big visions this uh, drawing here is done by uh, the son of uh, two parents sitting down there Cyril are you listening yes <laughs> it's a fascinating scale to work in China and it's 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 giving you a lot of opportunity it's very hectic it's chaotic and it's unpredictable but we find the complexity of the project and the ability for us to actually test things very, very interesting. We also go down to the urban details of public spaces. So we do actually build. And when we do, we get very, very fascinated with the details. So, for instance, with the narrative and geometry, you can build something like this. This is Slussplan in Malmö a way to get down to the water that all origins from one shape, a triangular shape. This is the, the location of the site. One area is busy, the other one is calm. Black is busy, white is calm. Black needed to protect better, white could have more space on the water. And eventually there was enough space to go into the water. So only using the triangular shape in the master plan, in the concept idea of the space, we could bring it also down to the detail of the wooden furniture, the sculptures. And this journey from a larger scale and down to the details, that is what we think is, is very fascinating. It's connecting things on two different scales. I think everyone love this project except maybe the carpenter that had to build it but he eventually got into it he got fascinated and it did such a tremendous job and i visited this this summer and the wood is still as good it's very very good we like to celebrate seasons this we deal with a lot in sweden so when you come up with an idea of, of a floating restaurant looking like this you have to think of it being a model system because in the autumn, less people will visit. In the winter, only a few will be there and then it's summertime again. A lot of the projects we work with is related to water. It's maybe not that strange as Sweden have many lakes and we also have a very long coast. And as many coastal countries, we've used our coast for industries or harbors. So cities like Malmö, Gothenburg, Stockholm and all the other cities on the coast, they have never really, really planned to be looking at the sea. It's never been placing the housing, it's never been about recreation, it's been the harbor. It's always been this distance. Now there's a different time and now the cities are going to the water. I think many of you would know the example of Malmö that have built this new neighborhood on the waterfront. Stockholm is moving closer to the water, Gothenburg is. So we have been involved in various of these water projects. It's a big challenge, of course, because it's not anymore only about recreation. It's not only about having access to water. It's so much also about how to protect from water. So we collected uh, some of the pictures of, of, of water projects that we dealt with. It's anything from trying to make an artificial beach in Finland to dealing with storm water in the neighborhood. Invent again a beach or other recreational uh, beach also in Stockholm. And to think about what is it like to live on the water? What does it mean? Because living on the water is not only an apartment. It means your access to water. It means the city's access to water. 
you cannot have a private relationship to the water that is for everyone. And we have even something in Sweden called allemansrätt. Have you heard of the word? It's a very Swedish word, allemansrätt. It means no matter if there's a private owner of land, you can always access the land, except if it's his or her garden. So you can go out camping for one night without asking the owner. You can cross land, you can go out running, you can go with a boat. I have a boat in the archipelago of Stockholm. I find an island, I just stay by the island. As long as it's not a house on the island or a garden, I cannot enter into. So this puts a lot of perspective when we start to put private housing close to water. Therefore, also Stockholm municipality works a lot with what is the city giving back? And this is public space. And the project I showed you was one example. Yeah, the recreation by the water, that's the other aspect. And the third one, which is the most difficult one, which is the hottest topic of today, it's the protecting against water. Because even though we imagine the days to be sunny, that's what we like, yeah? Like this. The bad days always come. And they look like this. So we took part in a competition in southern China. Southern China gets hit more and more by typhoons. And I visited when Mangkot had just hit the southern China a year and a half ago. Of the trees and the buildings that had stood on this beach before the typhoon, there were, I would say, less than 20% still standing. Now, the competition wasn't about making a beautiful design in terms of proving that this is a destination when it's a good weather, because that wasn't the problem. It was even the opposite. They had about 50 to 100,000 visitors a day to the beach. So actually one part of the task was to find a way to limit the access to the beach. The task was to build a protective landscape that actually could sustain such a thing as the typhoon. Because when it hits, it hits very bad. And unfortunately, looking at statistics, this is happening more often and they are becoming stronger. So it's a reality. It's, it's not, you cannot sort of close the book and hope it's not going to happen again. It's a reality. The reality is also that these seaside cities or locations, they of course depend on the income of people coming there, spending money, staying at the hotels, etc. And when that typhoon is happening, it all gets shut down. So there's nobody earning any money. So when I was there presenting the project, I stayed in this big, big hotel, very fancy hotel on the coast. It was so empty because the whole beach was closed. And that was going into a season when they have an expectation of about 50 to 100,000 people a day. So this is also interesting from the point of view of you don't need to argue very much with the people behind the investments in this area that you need to make a change because they're very willing to do this. The only question is how to do it with not destroying the natural landscape, which is the other side of the coin. So what we did with the project was to re uh, design a resilient landscape to protect from the occurring storm events. And to only give you two slides of the project, I selected these two sections. Now this is the existing condition. It's a wide, wonderful beach coming up to a higher point where you have pavilions and then you have a bit of a forest, streetcars, parking, and then you come to the hotel. It's all perfect for the sunny day. It's just that when the typhoon hits, it takes all the sand from the beach, throws it on to the trees. The trees fall and then it just goes on all the way to the entrance of the hotel. So what we came up with was a topography that would allow for both protecting the hinterland and to protect the program that we added to the beach. 
So by higher landscape, we could create these pockets in between that would be sheltered. These ones were functioning as bunkers that actually could be completely shut down when the hurricane came because nobody will uh, be on the beach at the point. And then you see something yellow going up, uh, going into the water. Because we can also not protect ourselves and put ourselves behind the dike and think this is it, this is done, now we're fine. Of course we still need to dare, we need to go on the other side, we need to be on the ocean, we need to stay happy, we need to understand that the beach is where we want to be. We only construct the landscape in such a way that it can sustain the typhoon. So therefore we had to dig um, on the other side and put our toe into the water. So we also stretched all the way out into the water with what is called the golden, golden spoon. Now to reach the golden spoon, the event out in the water where we want all the people to come out, you actually have to go into the water first. So that's a little bit of a test. Do you dare? Do you want to get wet? Fine, then you go out and you can spend a wonderful day on the golden spoon. So what do we dream about? We dream about playful landscapes. We dream about new type of spaces in the cities. We dream about comfortable microclimates. Unexpected scale jumps. And the inclusive cities. Cities for everyone. Sometimes when you work, you need to find the identity of a place, of, of your project. And it's really difficult. So uh, to identify the identity, that's something that we deal with very often in our projects. For this one, I took an example of a competition that we did in Toronto. If you've ever been to Toronto, you know that one time in history, they built a huge highway on the water. This highway more or less ruined all the contact to the water and as part of that you have this sort of in-between land plots that hasn't really been developed until just recently when they started to build condominiums. In this case here, this used to be an off-ramp area and is now just a hole between the new skyscrapers. This is what it once looked like. And this is still remaining. These are the pillars of the off-ramp coming down. So the first question we asked ourselves, is this something we want to remove or do we keep? And our conclusion was quite instant. We need to keep them. Because they actually in themselves show an identity. It's easy to say now we remove them because there's still this uh, highway and it's called Garden Expressway and, and, and people will, will know of it, but maybe in the future not. So we, we said, no, we need to keep them. But you can't do very much with them because they're huge. They look like this. We study them in detail. Some are tall and thin and a few of them are fat and low. So what do we do with them? We said, let them just be what they are. Don't put anything on them, don't, don't, don't fake them, but let them be what they are. But then add something to them, make them have a purpose, give them an identity. And instead of being all the same, let them all be different, which, was, which would be this other kind of idea of inclusiveness and variation into the city. So we threw uh, a few rings on them. And we let them all develop into different functions, all based on the geometry of the pillar itself. So in this case here, it became swings, there was a roof, one became a table, one was, uh, uh, this was actually required by the um, uh, competition program, a dog led out. Um, there are more dogs than uh, children in the center of uh, 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 Toronto. So that was very important. So we all gave them various identities, though they stayed themselves.
Now they wanted a park, a pocket park. So that's how it started. The pillars and the way we treated them, they were elements in the park. This was the story to get from the existing site to the green dreams. So we maximized green. They wanted an oasis. We gave them several oasises because we redefined the word to say that an oasis is somewhere where you find things different. It's a space within a space. And one isn't enough. Let, let's give them many. So that was the rings. So it becomes this park that you just need to visit. So this was our proposal to York Street Park in Toronto. We did not win the competition. So also when you deal with vegetation and you think of different seasons, you can't really have this green lush image and then talk about January in Toronto because it's cold. There is nothing green at that time of the year. The park will not have the body that you wish for and it has in the summertime. So that was another reason for giving these um, pillars this addition. Because in the winter time, they would be the one that showed this is the park. We are curious. We think it's very important to step outside of the comfort zone and think <clears throat> to what we can reach. We don't think that we ever have a problem that we cannot solve. It is a challenge, and the challenge we need to put into mindset of being an opportunity that we want to take on. We're always curious to what lays, lays behind, what is hidden, what is behind the corner. So when working, we need to constantly ask questions. And we need to question the answer that we've been given to sort of keep on searching. The experimentation we've talked about. The storytelling and how we do that through images. Images are very important to us. We bring them in early in the design process because it's, it's where we test the expression that we can't really only show in a plan. And in the end, the image is what we can show to somebody else. This is what we think. So somewhere we need to start this very early in the process of the work we do. One way to tell a story or to explain a project is through steps. This is essential to us, to divide any system into many layers, through diagrams in various ways. And hopefully land with what we all can sort of agree on is the concluding diagram, the concluding diagram. The concept that can explain everything. And this is one of them. It's going under the name of the Hawaii, Hawaiian diagram. Through sketches. Hand sketches was something that we kind of forgot for some years. And we brought it back into the work again very much. Both to represent ideas as actually the final way of telling this is what we want, but also to use it as quick actions in the processes. It's a wonderful tool and somewhat it's, it's this either gets too perfect with renderings and you get a little bit bored and it gets a little bit dead and with hand-drawn drawings you can sort of get the dynamic back into the image again. We care and we share. And in the search for the hidden story, we also look for the creation of the public life in the existing space. This is where we always need to start. 
We can look in many various directions, or we can read books, but we need to be at the place. So the site visit, extremely important. And to talk to people or to read books about this place, the history of it, it's crucial. Because how can we otherwise invent the new space if we don't have the knowledge of what it is today or what it wants to be? Because somewhere it's a hidden jewelry that just doesn't know how to express itself. It's also about the reclaiming of forgotten spaces, the reimagination of lost spaces, and all this together are identities that we search for in the projects. This is a competition in Reykjavik. Looks like this today. This is our proposal. This restaurant here is a pure inspirator for the design. There used to be a bus stop, and a guy came up with the idea to turn it into a food hall, a gathering space with open doors. So while waiting for the bus, you can go inside, you can have a beer, you can have a sandwich, or you cannot have anything if you want. It's cold outside, you hang out inside. All windows around. So inside, you see outside. Being outside, you see inside. It's wonderful. It's great. The middle temperature in, in Iceland is four degrees in the summertime. In the wintertime, sorry. It's 11 in the summertime. That's why it gets a bit confusing. So it's a climate that doesn't allow to be outside all the time. You need to have and you want to have the sheltered spaces. We took that as an inspiration. So being inspired by this building and the new function of it, we started the journey in the competition on how to come up with an idea. So the competition was about the square, but we took the building into the square and we said the food hall, that's our starting point. And the first thing we did was that we actually copied the building and not so much the building itself, but the function as we really liked it. We moved these functions to fit with the context, to adapt to the context. And we added the program into these areas, various urban activity functions, to create what could be the new activity center of Lemmer, the place in Reykjavik. But we, what we needed to do, and what we did on top of this, was to invent a new climate. Because people are not going to play ping pong outside in the autumn in Reykjavik. So the next step we did was actually to shelter all these spaces. We did not put the building and then put the function into the building. We put the function on the square and we created sheltered uh, roofs or walls to these functions. So that together with the food hall, we made an extension into the square with spaces that you can go inside that you can be inside and see outside, etc. Not a typical public space. And this was also supported by the idea that we needed to densify the life on the street or on the square. Because traditionally, we want to make squares empty. Because that's where you want to have the flexibility. Traditionally, that's also where you have the functions on the sides. But in this case, it was just too large of a distance between the edge and the city center, and you would lose people. No one would actually go out to the middle. So that was also another reason to bring functions into the square and to give them a volume, to actually create more squares within one. So an example of one of these sheltered uh, bull or ping pong situations where they also create this identity, unique identity. And also here, the choice of material is very related to the materials used at Ice in Iceland, etc. So no hard line between inside and outside. That was very important. This was the plan drawing. Where this was very important, how you would actually perceive this as one public space, open or in, open, inside or outside. The intervention of new space. 
we had a commission a few years ago to make an investigation on what a space in a city could be. So this wasn't a commission that was meant to be a master plan, a, a building or any concrete, but it was to imagine what a spaces in cities could be. The only task we were confronted with was, this is for an area where we want to have a very dense and compact uh, development in combination with that we also want a lot of public life. So we challenged this and we came up with a few different ideas on how spaces could work together and how public space and private space and office space and living space could be living together. So the first thing in this journey was that we took the box of a space, if we imagine a three-dimensional space, the space we need to breathe. We gave it a bit of a shape and we considered it as a sheltered space in the city that we wanted to protect in place. We added a structure on top of it and we put it in such an angle where we could get the maximum sunlight into the building on the two sides. So they were all facing facades towards the sun and we kept the sheltered space inside. And we came up with the idea of a home for the elderly on the outside and a youth club in the inside. So public space that became part of the city structure but yet inside of a building with two different target groups living and playing close to each other. Another test or journey we took was the issue of stormwater and the handling of rainwater in the city. Because we face very often this issue and we have a tendency to find it an issue. Which means that we look at the issue of too much rain as a problem. It is a problem in many current city situations today. But now building for the future, we can do something different. So instead of saying that we want to hide it and we want to lead it away, we gave a building block a waste and opened up like a champagne, champagne glass the maximum to receive the maximum rain. So again, we gave it two sides, the two facades, and this became the, the water glass where we, instead of leading water away or not wanting it, we actually maximized the collection of water into the green garden, where we could use the facades to be green and the space inside to be wet and green. So the idea was not start with the buildings, but start with the spaces. Define the different type of spaces that the city would like to have. It's the public space such as the train station, the bus stop, the kindergarten, etc. On top of that, you drape the program, the build program. And this time, the build program actually has to adapt to the spaces. We did a research and collected the ideas of 50 different spaces, anything from how big of a space three-dimensionally a tree needs in the city to an outdoor cinema, to a hub for public transport, basketball court, etc. We need a lot of spaces. And if it is what we want, the guys here to the right are the ones that have to give space for them. Uh, and hopefully they marry happily. On the move to be in the mood. So one, one aspect that we very often are confronted with is we are here and we want to get here. Are we looking for the shortest way, the simplest solution, or do we want to take a detour? Or do we want to experience an adventure something on the way to where we get? We believe in the second one. So by, by thinking and understanding that we're not only heading somewhere, but we're actually standing here and the next step is as important, we also slow down in the process and we start to be careful 
in the design we do. This was a competition in Finland that we did. The intervention that we came up with that made us a winner was very basic. We extended the city grid. The city grid was laid out by a Swedish architect after the city had burned in the 18th century. That's straightforward. A city grid we all believe in. Out of 60 proposals, we were one out of the 60 that proposed the city grid. All the others, they went circles, uh, blobs, uh, suburban style, anything. Anything but the uh, city grid. The city grid expands into the site. It's forming these clear blocks, straightforward. And by adding fire alleys that we also could pick from the existing city, by adding streets, east, west, etc., we could form the base of the structure. This was one of the streets that we came up with. A street that would collect all the rainwater, only have private entries, and would be this kind of in between private and public situation. And for anyone having kids, you know how easy it is if you have a street, a safe place where kids can go out and play, and neighbor kids come, and everyone. It's wonderful. This was one of the streets. And other areas that we imagined, the mix between different topologies and the courtyard. But now, how did we go one step further? Not only present the city grid, because the only the city grid today would maybe not do it all. So we searched for certain locations surrounding the site where we would understand that a lot of people would go to or come from crossing the space. So, for instance, this is the position of one of the most important schools. Now, the students, when they're finished, they will go back into the city. This is the arena where people go and watch football and other sports. People will go into the city. And people will come from the city to where they live. By identifying these locations and the possible routes of how they would move across site, we identified corners that became important. Corners that we wanted to treat more than other parts of the area. And again, we pushed and pulled to create the best sun condition, to create a microclimate, and to support the public space in these locations. So this is one example where you enter and the building is tall, it's on the north side, it's south facing public corner on one of the streets. This is uh, a picture from uh, Sicily. This is what I talked about earlier. One picture that can show and tell so much about quality and the feeling of human scale that we wish for. Not knowing what happens behind the corner, feeling that there is a contact with this entrance here, a relationship with the second floor, this building being put in front of your way, all this doing of a, of a space that we wish for, that creates this experience of, of something that you, you're not fully sure of what it is. So this is very important. We need to look back in history. We need to learn. We can copy or we can use to develop. And when we do this, we keep our eyes open to look for the unexpected. Because if we do, then we might see this on a regular street in Amsterdam one evening. It might also trigger our mind to think beyond what maybe is the solution that we all agree on today. Now, this is an example. We drive a lot of cars. We have an issue of a bit too many cars on the streets in the cities, right? What do we want to do? We want to limit the car traffic. So we arrange with the various solutions. We get a bit more space. 
So we get wider sidewalks, right? We can plant more trees, we're all happy, better, right? We know the scheme. We go from the car-dominated city to the pedestrian-friendly, public, uh, public transport-friendly uh, city. It's all good. But the street was still designed for cars. Maybe we even planted trees because we're moving in one direction. If it's an existing street that was turned into a car street, we probably destroyed all the contact between buildings that once were there. So it's not enough. It's, it's, it's not the space that is maximized in the city. The step further is to think of the sequence between buildings on two sides. We start to think of how people actually move. When you go in to the city, you want to go shopping. You're not going to go one street, like long direction. You're going to go between the shops, coffee, you feel for beer. You cross space, huh? You need to make a phone call. You go back home, it starts to rain. That's how we operate, in small sequences. So this is what we need to do. We cannot just be happy with the wide sidewalk and the big trees and less cars. We need to reinvent the sequences of the city. And by doing this, we can also talk about microclimate. Because in March, when the sun is up, you don't sit on a terrace on a big street. It's still too cold. It's windy and the sun isn't strong enough. But everyone knows that if there is a sun-faced wall, that's where you want to be. We can create those in the cities. And we can start to drag the context into the street and instead of thinking in this direction, we can think in this direction. It's the last project. Has any, everyone now got it? Or? <laughs> of course, I'm, I'm in Prague. I had to show it. So I was here a year ago and received the second place for this competition. I'm very happy, honored, super nice. Uh, just annoying that we didn't get the number one. But this was one of the trickier competitions, I think, that we've entered into. Why? Because there was very little said about what is the vision? What do we want this to become? Except for there is a traffic situation. There is an issue of not accessing or being able to access certain spaces. And there are numerous of other issues. But you, 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 you're not really asked to add program. You cannot invent buildings. It wasn't this imaginative competition where you would just remove all the traffic or put them underground and then make a green hilly landscape. You were restricted by the fact that tram had to stay, etc. We did what we could out of it. And one thing <clears throat> that we quite often start a competition or a project with is to define one, two or three legs that we want the project to stand on. That can be done by three sketches, or three models, or it can be three cartoons, or it can be, as in this case, three different legs that we wanted to stand on. And it's also for us to give ourselves sort of a momentum to go into the competition. The first one was the site itself, the scale of it. The second one was the configuration of the city and the square being part of the city. And the third one was the landscape. Not the landscape in the city itself, but the landscape outside of the city. So this was the starting point, this roundabout with a circle in the middle. So one thing that we said was that it's a fragmented space. It's hard to enter certain spaces, certainly not the middle, and the four different sides are not really connected to each other. So the first step we took was to say that we need to unify the space. But to unify the space with still the traffic in the middle was quite difficult. It wouldn't 
be enough to paint it all yellow. The third thing that we said was that it's way too much focus on the central axis due to the traffic. But we're not here to fix the traffic. The traffic is there. It's actually functioning very well. That's not the issue. The issue is that the spaces between the traffic isn't functioning. It's not working. It's not attracting enough people. So what we did was that we nudge the circle, the center point, the gravity of the space. Because we wanted to place it more towards where people actually want to spend time. And by doing this, we create a better connection, but we also freed space on the other side. So it became a variation of spaces. We had to anchor <coughs> this circle or the nudged circle also with four social anchor points. Those are very essential as magnets. It's very good to have spaces open for flexible use. But as a designer, you also have to envision what can create a gathering. How can you design it? So what can be an anchor point? Well, this became the unified, activated, and social square, where we use the trees as the unifying element on one hand side and the floor as the other unifying element. And by nudging it, we also got away a little bit from this very kind of baroque type of layout with uh, trees in the middle circling the traffic system, but actually off-grid doing something more for the public space. Uh, thank you very much uh, for an inspiring talk. My name is Peter. I'm not an architect, so I may ask a question which is maybe answered by the history of architecture. Uh, I haven't heard a mention about like the history of the country you work in. Can you comment on in how you factor in uh, not just the local habitat, but also a wider context? Thank you. Sweden, you mean? Uh, I would say you work around the world. Yeah. And uh, if, I would, if I would be provocative, maybe it's, it's a good way to start a more yeah, yeah. Vi a lively discussion. Yeah. I would say how you avoid imprinting Swedish values yeah. and Swedish context on the places where you work. Thank you. That, that would be a good thing, right, or not? No. Um, it's, it's, it's a good question. We, um, we work in various countries. Uh, and uh, I would say that every project and every context is very unique. We, of course, have a lot in, in the bags that we carry with us. We have a lot of ways of working, uh, ways of viewing things. We have an opinion about things that we bring from Sweden. At the same time, if I look at myself, I am Swedish, but I'm partly, for the most part, actually brought up abroad with other influences. So working in Sweden, I can actually bring this into the Swedish market. Uh, and then going abroad, I somewhat can understand to pick up what we uh, enter into. Uh, we have a great help with the 13 different nationalities in the office. So also when we work in China, we have Chinese people working on that. It's amazing to how much we learn by each project and how we have to understand how to handle that specific project for that, for that local context. Uh, when we don't do good, I think we also learn that we don't do good. Um, we do a lot of projects in Finland. Finland is probably the second market for us. Um, when we go into the mood of really understand what the project, how the project could be done uh, for the best of Finland or for the best of that project, we do good. When we apply ideas, like Swedish ideas on it, it doesn't work out. We, um, we try to spend a lot of the time into the project process in the research analysis. So before we start to have somewhat of an idea, we would probably do a round of two, three, four sketchbooks. 
where we go into the analysis and to the depth of the site and the country and we translate documents, etc. So we also try to make the team experts before starting to judge what is good and bad or what could we do with things. Um, one other trick is that with the different languages, we also always translate documents and also back to its native language. And um, we also present the projects in the office where we also try to get feedback and uh, responses. I give you small answers. I don't know if that's fully answering your question, but there's an awareness and we work in Canada a lot and there we work with we have a Canadian hired in, in Canada, and it's, it's excellent. But it's also that the client very often wants to have the Scandinavian touch to it, which is it's another way that why we work there. They want also to have us and share our ideas. Um, but then working with the Canadian, that's excellent, because then you can sort of understand when to hit and when to pull back, when you might actually propose something that is clever and maybe when you're going wrong. So it's a, it's a live and learn uh, kind of situation. Yeah. Hi, hello. I would have a question regarding, you said you're doing a lot of master plans and those are processes which go through a lot of maybe tens, maybe even more years. So how do you adjust your proposals so they can change maybe in time or mm. you can't predict really everything. So what's your approach in this topic? So obviously some, some projects, some master planning projects that we work on, we take part maybe for two, three years and then either the, the commission goes to someone else or it gets it stops or it changes and so on. But with the projects that we have <clears throat> and we are allowed to continue to work on, it's excellent. And, and quite a few of the projects we work on are stretching over a very long time. We, um, what we do is that we try as early as possible in the process to establish the storytelling. That's why I brought it up uh, today. By establishing a story and to ex in order to explain why we do certain things, we can always come back to that story and explain that again and again and again. Now, when you work on the projects that span over a long time, in the end, maybe you're the only one that are present from the first time, the first meeting. The clients, they've all gone and new ones have come. So what we do is that we collect every step, we document every step, and we make sure that every step is connected to the step before. And that's the storytelling. So we built up, a, uh, conceptual storytelling which isn't about design it's a statement it's like this water arena that you show uh, that I showed you it doesn't matter if it's a rectangle or if it's circle or whatever it is it's about the space it's an established space it has a reason it took us very long time to actually define it and to be able to argue for it but we established it and that story comes back and comes back and comes back it goes into the discussions with the developers who wants to change and build more, build less, do the changes, then we can bring back this quality book and we can explain and we can have a conversation. And the nice thing is that if you can have a story and you're bringing it, in, it, bringing it in in conversation in early time, then I think most people are also very perceptive. They, they want to listen, they want to learn, they want to understand. And then you get this very good relationship with the, with the developer. Um, it, of course, sometimes you work on something and then it say, stop. There's one project that we just love uh, to show you tonight that we can't show. Because we worked on it, we worked on it, and then we're about to go public and then they say, stop. And now when we continue, it's completely starting over. So we also learned that how you go somewhere and then it takes a stop and then we have to back and sort of build a new story. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the lecture. Uh, I have a quiet um, task. Uh, how, many, how many people you have in your team normally? 
uh, how many people working on a, one project and uh, how you divide the whole work between them, what positions like they have in this team and uh, what tasks they have. Yeah. So we're about 20 people in the office and we have uh, maybe ongoing projects uh, between 10 to 30 projects less intense or more intense. We do a lot of competitions, so we get into time periods where we have a lot of deadlines. Um, usually, I would say you have, you have a project leader, responsible project leader, one partner, me or Patrick. Then you have two to three more people working on the project. So even on these very large projects, such as China competitions, maybe four people. So they are uh, all architects, or uh, I don't one, know. One, about one third uh, have studied housing architecture. One third have studied landscape architecture. One third have studied urban planning, and then a few have studied a little bit both urban design, mix. And we also never, of course, there are certain projects where you need specific knowledge, where we have people that work on them. But on many of these projects that uh, that I showed today will have a mix uh, between professions. And um, I think that's crucial to us because we don't want anyone to look at only the buildings. We don't want anyone to look at only the landscape. It's, it's to look at what makes sense for this project, what is interesting. And many times I would say that neither comes out of the profession of architecture or landscape architecture. It comes out of the understanding of the context, the inspiration of whatever, history, movie, uh, landscape, uh, something from the outside. So we like these conversations and, and also to allow for the unexpected type of conversation. Because sometimes I must say that we, we don't know how to enter into the project and then we need this also maybe input from the outside that is completely unexpected, which I think you can get if you're not kind of boxed in with your discipline. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Hello. I have two simple questions. What software do you use? And what is Manda? Manda work. Yeah. The first one is very simple. It's the standard package. We, um, we would do most work in, in AutoCAD. We sketch a lot, a lot in uh, Illustrator. Then we bring it into SketchUp. Um, most of the renderings we bring to such a level in SketchUp that we can export them into Photoshop. Um, sometimes we use Rhino. For some projects we need to use um, other drawing uh, 3D softwares. Um, yeah, that, that's it. And then the Adobe package. Um, I sketch in Photoshop. That's what I do. Um, the second question was what Manda means. Manda means um, Manda means spirit. Manda means team spirit. Manda means uh, it's us. Um, I fully and 100% believe that we would not do these type of projects if it would not have been for the team. Uh, it's not one person. It's not one of the founders. We don't have a star in the office that can do it all by himself or herself. Uh, it's together. It's challenging sometimes because if you put up a drawing, I will be critical. I will ask you. I will question it. I will push you. But you will do the same to me. And we want to feel proud and we want to feel that we've shared. So I talked to the students before and I said that one way to, to avoid when you work in a group to have like discussions about this is my sketch, I don't want to follow your sketch, you know, proudness and all this that can happen. Bring as much as, as possible into the drawing table. Sketch together, mix them, pick ideas, go back, continue to draw, come back again, and then eventually it gets so blurred out, whoever came up with the first idea that you don't know. Proudness is gone and you work as a team. That's all, not always like that, of course, but uh, that's what we strive for. And I, I, need, I need the challenge. I need someone to challenge me. I need someone to, to say, this is what I believe in. This is, this is what I think is good. Because that triggers me. Is it? Is it? Wait a minute. Uh, is it? 
are you sure? You know, you start to think. Um, and then you start to question it, and then maybe you start to develop. And the same thing people do to me. So Manda is team spirit, somewhere like that. Yeah. Anyone else? Thanking, thank you for taking the time to listen to me. Have a good evening.